Thank, thank you for that. You mentioned uh, Northrop Fry. Would you like to say a bit more about that in terms of what is Northrop Fry, the matter of criticism? What the sense in which that, that work uh, tells us a little bit the sort of the story that you're describing? Yes. Northrop Fry, <coughs> when did he die? In 1993 or something, but about 20 years earlier, he had written in one chapter this notion that tragedy could only exist at the time of imperial aspirations and therefore explained that there were no Roman tragedies and that what you had after a period of for want of a better word, for, of classical tragedy in Athens, 60 years, what you had immediately afterwards was imitations. Imitations by the Greeks and later imitations by the Romans. And he added that further in what happened after Shakespeare and Shakespeare's contemporaries was imitation. You had Dryden. And that it was that somehow that this was a pattern and that the huge impetus of what I was hoping to touch on, of what happened when they became rich in an empire and decided not to do that in a military way, but in an intellectual way, and to sort of <coughs> encourage the arts. I mean, Herodotus started there. <laughs> like, I mean, the idea of history. Rhetoric is huge, because the setting up of the Areopagus, the court, but two years before Aeschylus wrote his play, was hugely important for one other thing. It in, they invented rhetoric. If you, the hardest thing of doing the Agamemnon was that there was a chorus and one person for most of the play. There's no dialogue, no quarrel. It was just one person talking back to the chorus. Exactly what Aristotle said, that the theater began from chorus, dance, and one person, an answer, a, hip, a hypocrite, as you know the word. And so, <coughs> So that's enough on that. Yeah. Uh, could you just say in your imagination what you think the music would be like in these tragedies, both in terms of the chorus and in terms of, for example, in the opening of the Medea when uh, they're, they appear to be singing together? Well, I can't tell you, I, I, I can only give you a generic answer of what the more music itself was like. I mean, whether it was atonal, it was extremely important to the writers because they attached emotional feelings to the key, if you will, that the music was in. Now what we never do when we're reading translations, or even reading it in Greek, recognize that in the early stages, at least a half of the plays were sung. And secondly, when you get further on, for example, in Iphigenia and Aulis, huge sections of extraordinary emotion were meant to contrast with logic which was spoken. So you had a rhetorical argument between Agamemnon and Menelaus, but followed by the weeping of the daughter. And even though she might be singing about her own thoughts and feelings, the singing turned it into emotion. So it's very complicated. And what you're talking about, the beginning of the Medea, namely that the nurse comes out and says, it's terrible, it's awful. I wish they hadn't built the Argo. There's Brad Pitt again. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, and then you hear Medea singing off stage for a very long time. And what this does, and what it did for that audience, is to say this is a woman in terrible pain. And it's entirely <coughs> empathetic. Anyone watching, reading the Medea these days only sees a tabloid headline, headline from the Inquirer. But if you saw it in the original, there were two things that were happening. One was that she became empath sympathetic from the singing, from the beginning, and not just from the situation itself but also something else. One of the hardest things for the Athenians to get their minds around because they had no Moses was what to do with why thou shalt not kill. They didn't have anyone saying thou shalt not kill. They just knew that if you did, you ought to be prosecuted by the people whose family you killed or in revenge. It was that simply justice was revenge. So for Medea, 
her husband, she has given her oikos, her family, three times. Her father, her brother, and now he's taking her oikos away from her, her family. And all she can think of is that perfect justice is killing the things he loves, which is her children. The tragedy is she loves them more than he does. That's an alien concept to us. It's terribly hard, but very Athenian. Yep. Nick, this dislocation between the subject matter of the tragedians and the time in which they wrote. Yes. Right? The, the matter of Freud that they're working from. Yes. Years and years, centuries and centuries beforehand, there's a kind of dislocation there. I'm just wondering um, how that, that, that gets collapsed over time. Yes. You know, in, in, in Hamlet, when Hamlet says of the player, what is what is Hecuba to him or him to yes. Hecuba that he should weep for her? Yes. Um, that actually could be said also of the Greek players themselves. Yes. Because Hecuba is already centuries in the past. Yes. So is Shakespeare aware of that irony, do you think, by that time? Or oh, is Shakespeare it, aware of the has irony? The, has the, 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 the distance between I think that I think that no, I, it's it's wonderful. I think one of the answers to that is that, say, in Hamlet, you always have a notion of performance as meta theater. It's always talked about. That is, you have um, seems, madam. Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak. The very first words. I'm not. I, I, I am. I am being real. He says. But the, the, the other part of your question, and that doesn't answer it except to say that I, I think there is a distancing possible. That's why Shakespeare uses what's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her. Is that, uh, that how can he do that? But what, what's so strange about the Greeks is that they use this mythology, which is 700 years old, but they create figures and this is both Sophocles and particularly Euripides, whom people would say you can meet those people in the street. I mean, Agamemnon in Iphigenia and Aulis is an idiot. He's Schwarzkopf. He's an ordinary guy who can't get his head around moral questions. That makes it all the more painful. A father who loves his daughter but somehow has this mid military notion in his head. That's entirely contemporary. That's not the Iliad, if you know what I mean. It's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that strange, what I called parochial earlier. <laughs> that is, it's the immediacy of contemporary people dealing with infanticide, matricide, incest, all the things that gave Freud a job. <laughs> right. Uh, yes, uh, I have a follow-up question on, well, your overall theme is how Athens-centric this tradition is. Uh, and uh, a question, do we know anything about the performance history of these plays? Were they performed in cities outside of Athens? No, not in this century. Not, not at the time that I've been talking about, namely from the beginning of empire to the death of Athens from 470 down to 405. No theaters anywhere else, no playwrights anywhere else. <coughs> Absolutely not. And, and is this maybe because this is the center uh, you know, of, of the culture of the empire and, and there is a sense of possession that this is culture for us what I didn't have time, I understand that. Right, I understand completely. I didn't actually have time to go into the details of pointing out that it was, it became tragedy by increments. It started with the dance telling the story of Dionysus, the god of fertility and wine. And that in itself was a local, eh, Athens was a small town. It was like I described, carrying fruits in baskets, wine pouring. It started small, but once it became an empire, it built this huge theater to show the world itself. So the subject was still tiny in the minds of the writers. They could use it. Tiny in terms of the people, but huge in terms of incest, death, matricide, and most importantly, 
the question of what is justice, because the Greek gods had nothing to do with justice. So these plays, this is a last note of this kind. One of the things I found that when I sat in on some of the rehearsals that I had to tell the actors is that <clears throat> making a choice was purely now. I'll try and explain that. Everything that you decide, talk, think about in Greek tragedy is immediate. You don't have priests to tell you what to do. You don't have the Ten Commandments. You don't have an afterlife. You don't have gods that are telling you what is just and what is unjust. It is all up to you to decide what is right and what is wrong. And that is a terribly difficult, painful, immediate thing. And it's what makes what I've been talking about so huge. That is, this dumbbell, Agamemnon, that, is, that uh, Euripides created at the end. <laughs> Sorry to call him that. He's more than that. But this ordinary man can't get his head around it because it's too big. And there were no religious solutions, which is why the mantra of Greek tragedy is count no man happy until he's dead. When you led us through some of the theaters on, in the islands we, off of Athens some 20 years ago, yes. um, I guess I wasn't listening closely. But they, these were very large, very impressive, acoustically in every way, yes. structures. And what was, when were they built? What was performed there? How did right. tragedy well, get from Athens to there? The, there were some, well, let me just say that the theater, instead of being a once a year in Athens religious festival in honor of Dionysus, even though the Greeks uh, themselves didn't, know why it had to, by this time, what has it got to do with dinosaurs? Nothing. <laughs> when that died, when Athens died, theater became professional. There is a novel which is a very nice, called The Mask of Apollo by Mary Renault, which is one of the few that catalogues what must have happened when, what was the privileged few, the actors in Athens were sons of the wealthy, the plays were put on by the wealthy, that now these theaters were built in various places. Why at Epidaurus, for example, is there this beautiful theater? Well, it was built because it was the center of the religious cult of Asclepius, the uh, medicine man. And people would come there all the time, and this was a, they would put on plays there. We're talking a hundred years later now. So the theaters at Delphi, the theaters at Epidaurus that we saw are in fact a hundred years later and were accommodating new playwrights, but not many. Guess who was the most favored? It was uh, Euripides. And there's the tiny touches of that that make it so wonderfully clear that it's going there. For example, in Iphigenia in Aulis, there is a slave slave that belonged to Agamemnon and to Clytemnestra. And what does he do? He influences the plot. A slave does. He's very sharp. He's the early prototype of all the cunning servants and slaves that go on <laughs> afterwards all the way through Moliere. He's starting that. There's, there's a democratization, if you will. That's not what I mean, but pretend that it was. <laughs> But you know what I mean, that is, that, that they became accessible in a different way with more ordinary people. Maybe we'll make this the last question. Yes. My question is, with such a large audience, how many people actually heard what was being said? Well, the first thing you obviously have to remember is that there was no traffic, no electricity, <laughs> no ambient noise, none at all. and. Uh, that it, it did not become a problem. But I remember reading a long time ago about the construction of the theater at Epidaurus. And it is, of course, like all the theaters, I'm supposed to stay behind, that with the circle for the dancing and a, a wooden stage behind and vomitoria up the sides. 
there's an e examination done of what the proportions were. Gee, it's unbelievable. They are on the Fibonacci series. Wow. Yes, it's divided perfectly into the golden mean and, right, and so that the top section is proportion to the next section, which is the fat in proportion to the whole. And the divisions, in the, they had a pretty incredible sense of how to have sound travel upwards. I've in fact recited the opening lines of the Antigone at Epidaurus. I did it after 300 Italian children left. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty wonderful. Thank you.